Hi, I'm Mike Seymour, and I uh, wanted to have a quick look at what's been going on with generative AI as it pertains to visual effects and in moves beyond what we're doing with simple prompts. In fact, I want to show you what's going on with Adobe. Now, you may have seen this already, but I think it's really worth considering the implications of this for visual effects. What Adobe's done is release a beta version of Photoshop, and in that beta version, you can use generative AI, uh, the sort of things that you've seen in Mid Journey or, or Stable Diffusion, to work additionally a still image of into something that's vastly more incredibly quickly. I'll show you that in one second, but the thing that uh, is extraordinary is how quickly this is moving. So basically we were doing stuff at the end of last year using uh, Mid Journey and stuff and producing great results, but they're not particularly controllable. And more to the point, it required you to really understand prompts. You had to really understand those special things like 4K, photorealistic, um, all those little extra things you had to put into the prompts to get such great results. I'm not saying that it wasn't magnificent, and it still is, but what I think is phenomenally interesting about what's happening with Photoshop is we're now seeing that core technology that were demonstrated in things like Stable Diffusion and have, of course, progressed, now moving into an area where they're being incorporated in tools. And we're only at the beginning of what uh, this is possible to do. So let's have a look at this shot, and uh, it's just a really simple shot. I'm going to play it and do it in real time. I'm not going to do any of those uh, speeding up uh, tricks of the uh, edit to hide how long things take. Okay, so this is a shot of my dog, and uh, I just took this in. Um, it's a JPEG. It's nothing special. And I'm going to use the generative AI tools in the beta version of uh, what's available in uh, Photoshop. So I'm just going to make it wider, which is exactly the kind of thing I might want to do because I don't like uh, portrait. I want landscape. I'm just going to select both sides of this picture one at a time and use this new uh, uh, toolbar to indicate that I want it to do a generative AI fill. Now, in pressing these buttons, um, I am not giving it any other information. I'm not even telling it what I want it to do in terms of completing the picture. And this is where it's really significant in terms of those prompts because what it's doing is it's looking at the image and then working out the style of the image and then matching that with a generative fill. And so there you go. And it gives you three results, which is kind of extraordinary in of itself. Okay, so I'm like the middle one because it makes that goalpost look sensible. So that's the other side. And again, all I'm doing is just selecting the area, not doing anything else, uh, and hitting generative fill, not giving it any instructions on what it should do, just leaving it blank. And it's going to do it based on the surroundings uh, of the shot. Uh, and of course, see what it does. So... In this particular shot, the top left section is just a complete guess and inference, if you like, of what we're seeing uh, in the middle of the shot. And it's going to do the same thing on this side, but it's going to do things differently on this side, of course, because there's that obvious line in the grass. And so it hopefully both pick up that line and extend it back. Now, this is happening in the cloud, not on my local machine, but nevertheless, pretty extraordinary. Now, there are too many people here in the background. It's a little distracting, so I want to minimize that. So again, without telling it what I want to do, I just select these people and hit Generative Fill again. Again, I'm not telling it what I want. I'm letting it guess what I want. Now, there's a couple of things it could guess, but the most obvious one is just minimizing the number of people back there. Again, I could be more specific with my instructions, but I'm not. I'm just letting it guess what I want to do. And let's see what it comes up with. In this particular case... It's never going to do the same results the same exact way. So if I was to do this again in two seconds, I'd get a slightly different result. So every time it's not contextualizing what it's done before. So it's correctly guessed that I wanted less people. Uh, it's still left a few. And so I'll try it again with a couple more people. And again, it's giving me three options every time. But, you know, let's see what it does. I also, by the way, don't need to exactly... Um, to mask things, it'll actually work out that if something's primarily masked, that that's what I want. So those last two people, I didn't draw very good uh, masks around them, but let's see what uh, it comes up with. Again, this is happening in a beta version, and even the beta version is changing uh, remarkably quickly. This wasn't even available last week, but this week it is. Okay, so it's doing, um, uh, as I was saying, do three different versions of this, and what it's done in, in this case is, again, reduce the people down. I can pick which one over I want. But now I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to say what I want. So I'm going to circle this area of the grass and say that I'd like to add something to this space. 
So this time I'm going to say, had a Labrador, Labrador um, puppy. Actually, let's make it a, a cute Labrador puppy. Had a cute Labrador puppy. That's all I'm giving it. And now it has some direction effectively. And so it's going to do the same thing, only this time it's going to have a directed prompt. But again, without anything about photo real, in perspective, correct lighting, anything like that. No special keywords, no special um, markers. So it's looking at the perspective of the shot that it's kind of reading and hopefully be able to give us something that looks kind of viable. So let's see what it comes up with. Okay, so I think we'd agree that's a cute puppy. Here's uh, the other variations. Now, if I didn't like that because I now said, uh, you know what, that's kind of what I want, but it's not quite in the right position, um, or it's not quite the right type of puppy, as I said, I can just hit regenerate. It doesn't lose the first three variations. You'll now end up giving me six variations of the uh, puppy, and there we go. Um, so again, I've got uh, chocolate-colored ones, I've got um, coffee-colored, and I've got uh, a sort of classic blonde, white kind of uh, puppy. Now, maybe now I see the puppy there, I think, hey, I'd actually like it on the other side. That's not kind of where I want it. So obviously on a separate layer, I can leave it over. But rather than masking it out, it's just gathered the whole uh, section, which isn't really what I want, right? I want it to have the correct grass. And you can tell that it's being patched on the left of my actual dog because the grass don't look matches. So when I hit regenerate again, it now says, oh, okay, I want the puppy on this side. It won't, however, give me exactly the same puppy. Um, that's not a feature that it currently has. So it's going to just regenerate um, another puppy in the new position. That being said, that's a better composition. I like that uh, and I'm done. Now, what's really interesting about this is that it's remarkably useful. But more to the point, me explaining this to you is not the only thing that you've been kind of watching. Because, in fact, this is vision that uh, is being done in Photoshop. But Adobe is also doing really remarkable things with audio. In fact, I haven't been using this microphone. It looks like I have. I've got a microphone here, and it looks like it's been recording what I'm doing. But just to prove that, I'm not moving, I'm not using it. I'll push it out of the way. What I've actually been doing is recording on this iPhone, which has also been uh, filming me. So this iPhone is the thing that we're lifting the audio from. I could also lift it from the original camera, which is even further away. But in either case, the audio doesn't sound this good. This is what the audio actually sounds like. This is what the audio sounds like off the iPhone. And this is what the audio sounds like off my uh, Canon R6. Uh, well, how, how has that improved? Well, what we can do is actually use uh, the new tool in beta for fixing audio that Adobe has provided. And you can see I just dropped the file audio onto here and it produces a improved version of the audio. So it's in fact doing audio and video. And that's kind of remarkable, right? And it doesn't stop there. This is obviously the video that I've been pulling off from the uh, iPhone, but of course, didn't look very good, did it? Because I cut from a sort of a 16 by nine landscape on my Canon to this uh, portrait shot. I should have shot the, uh, the uh, iPhone footage in portrait mode. Well. Let's fix that, right? I'm going to take in a still of me. And now I'm going to edit that still, doing exactly the same thing. Now, this is a much harder problem for it to solve than the problem that we just saw with the dog and the grass, because there's obviously no understanding of what could possibly be on my desk. And the background is very much in perspective. Um, they cropped it, cut off, and done in uh, completely different ways than what we saw. It's just like a much more detailed background uh, very different from what we had previously seen. Okay, so we're getting something that's kind of usable here. This is probably like plausible. Um, let's go the other side. And again, we're getting multiple uh, versions. Now, it's not going to be able to produce something that's photo real. In fact, I would argue that the point of this exercise is to show its limitations. But it's going to get us a long way there. It's going to be able to give us the perspective lines that we want and the kind of general framing that we want to be able to try a landscape shot. So having got two sides that I kind of like, I'm now just going to crop in on that. And that's giving me something that maybe I like. I could show this now to the director. If I showed this to the director now and said, hey, is this something that you wanted? And this is the kind of framing that we like. 
I could then obviously go in over the top of this and now produce high quality work that would be something that we would uh, have in a shot. I can't use this as it is as a shot, but I can certainly use it as a tremendous time saver to get me a lot of the way there. And if you've got something that's going to take you, I don't know, you know, four or five hours, if you've got a whole clip that's going to take you maybe uh, a day to do, eight hours, and you get like, you know, 50% of it done, maybe 75% of it done, you're saving six hours work. And that's where this stuff is amazing. I don't think this stuff replaces a visual effects artist. I think this stuff is going to give us the tools to be more productive, which means if you're an artist that knows how to use these tools, you'll get more work. But I don't think it's going to replace artists. But hey, this is moving so fast. I hope to do more of these videos to keep you guys up to speed. Thanks so much for watching. See ya.